Often in this section of Luke, the material is only in Luke, and that's going to be true of the main part to begin today of the rich fool. He planned a harvest, and it came in so good, he didn't know what to do with it, and rather than thinking about anybody else or God, he planned on building bigger granaries, his first and only thought. So that's only in Luke, and we'll get to that shortly. It's in Luke chapter 12. Uh, Before Jesus tells about this, somebody asked Jesus a question, and that's uh, what brought up the topic of greed. The question is in Luke 12, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13, Luke 12, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? That came to mind a couple times. I've been here 37 years, and only twice did we have to go in the office and have families fight over inheritance. And there are people that don't go here, so uh, you don't know about all the faces, but uh, uh, um, I, this verse came to mind, and I thought, why, uh, why are we doing this? And uh, everybody was still alive, mom and dad were alive, and uh, they divided it up, and because the one side of the family had uh, owed mom and dad so much money they took it out when they divided and everybody was mad at each other and I thought of these verses, if Jesus didn't have to do this, why does our church have to do this? So I don't really know what happened. But it is interesting that the stand-up question is in the middle of Jesus' sermon and Jesus had not been talking about money. Uh, remember last week's sermon, he's talking about you need to confess Jesus as Savior sometime on earth among other people. Sometime on earth you need to uh, pray up to God the Father and tell him that you want Jesus to be your Savior. So Jesus' story was about saving faith. He also talked about persecution coming. And when persecution comes, if you have a trial and you're on defense, you have to depend upon the Holy Spirit for what to say. This is what Jesus was talking about. And someone had been sitting there thinking about money and stood up and popped up with this question, which really didn't fit at all what Jesus was talking about. A missionary one time called the church, and he was a missionary in the Muslim parts of the Middle East, and he said, he actually called asking about getting books, but he uh, called about a church in California where he had just been, and he talked about uh, persecution and Christians being killed for their faith, and all and all and on, and then it was prayer time, and the first prayer was, Please pray that God will help the workmen put in the best swimming pool. And maybe that's okay to make the list, but that really bothered the missionary. I mean, he's talking about all this uh, persecution and terrible things. Well, I bring that up because that's kind of what this is like here. Jesus talked about the need to confess him before men so that... uh, You pray to ask Jesus to be your Savior sometime when you're in this life so that later Jesus will confess you before the Father. And then he talked about coming persecution, how to depend upon the Holy Spirit for trial and persecution. Then up pops this question of a uh, money. And not that it, not that the wasn't a real issue, but it's kind of like, We've been talking about persecution. We've been talking about, Jesus been talking about life and death. He'd been talking about the need to uh, pray and confess Jesus as Savior up to God in heaven sometime uh, while in this earth. And then up comes this question. And uh, you can tell already we're reading this much. I don't think Jesus liked it, but uh, as we read verse 15, he now starts talking about the topic of greed, which had something to do with the question about the inheritance. Let's read verse 15. 
He said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Well, there would be several forms of greed, and that's not hard to guess. One form of greed would be actually criminal, criminal ways to get more. Another form of greed may not be violent, but would be dishonest. That would be lying to get greed. The form of greed that would be the most confusing to just listeners would be honest in acquisition, but still greedy. Not, not that a lot of his listeners were cheats. Maybe they got an honest acquisition of money, but uh, the honest profit involved a worship of money. Uh, you know, not, not that all his listeners had to have made money the wrong way, but it was like money first. Money is the goal of life. Money is the reason to live. Abundance need not be sin, and uh, there are going to be some uh, rich people in the Bible. I plan on giving their names, but uh, uh, not the reason to live. That view and that philosophy uh, in the margins of my study Bible had 1 Timothy 6, 17. Um, now that, among that phrase, God gives us all things richly to enjoy. So that is positive. And uh, God might give people things to enjoy. And that's part of uh, thinking here. On the other hand, uh, 1 Timothy 6 also says not to be conceited and not to fix one's hope on uncertain riches. So 1 Timothy 6 allowed that uh, God might uh, give a person a lot, but not money worship, not snobbery, not a feeling or an action that one is better than everyone else, and not fixing hope on riches. That is, instead of making God the trust and making God the hope and making God's will the future, it's just uh, money, which seems to be what the question was all about that brought up this story of the rich fool. Now, later he'll tell a story about the rich man and Lazarus, but it does not use the word parable in Luke 16, so that they might have been real people. It doesn't use the word parable. Here it uses the word parable. So this is a uh, figure of speech, pair as in parallel, balo as in throw, to throw an illustration along. So uh, this is actually an illustration, not a real story, but it illustrates the uh, person who worships money. And uh, we continue with that in verses 16 and 17. And he told them a throw alongside, a parable, saying, The land of the rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there will I store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods. Laid up for many years to come, take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Parts of Israel don't grow very much. That's in the south and the Negev, and it's just mainly let the livestock graze on the weeds and on the grass. Galilee is very productive. Uh, even the central Israel along the Jordan River, if you irrigate, it can be very productive. And they always remember uh, melons. They had irrigation ditches, and they were growing melons out there, even though the land didn't look all that good. But some parts are very productive, and this person had made plans, and their plans came true, and they just had a lot more than even they expected. Now, he gives a quote that's three verses long, um, no reference to God in it. Uh, no reference that God had anything to do with it. Now, hard work is a part of success, but then it takes God's blessings also, so it takes both. And uh, here there's no reference to God at all. 
a number one command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and uh, wasn't thinking about God, wasn't thinking about others, love your neighbor as yourself, commandment number two. So his goal in life had nothing to do with work for God, had nothing to do with care for God's people. That's totally left out to love God first, love your neighbor as yourself. He basically loved money first and has success. So no thought of God. And he was uh, rich in some ways, but we might say he was poor in his thinking. Uh, it, uh, poor in his thinking that he didn't have to worry about anything else because right away he'll get sick. So if we think that abundance means there will never need to be any concern about anything else, that's not very good thinking. That's uh, poor in thinking. Also, he was poor in selfishness because not only is there a reference to, no, to God, there's no reference to anybody else, no friends. And I don't know whether I stress that much reading it, but there sure are a lot of eyes in that quotation. Uh, verses 17, 18, and 19 are three verses, but I, 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 I got six of them. I circled six eyes. What shall I do? This is what I will do. There are four more mys, all my goods. I will tear down my barns and build bigger barns for all my goods. So six eyes and four mys and two yous. We don't usually refer to ourself as a you, like we're talking to ourselves, but he has two of those. And then we hardly ever talk to our own souls. I will talk to my soul, soul. Add them up, there's 14 references to himself in three verses. So uh, wasn't rich in friends and wasn't rich in wisdom. He was rich in money, but he was very poor in uh, worry up to that time, and he was very poor in being selfish. Now we left verse 20 out because that's being poor in wisdom. And that wouldn't be a modern reader's conclusion. If God calls him a fool, then that's pretty good to put him in the poor in wisdom category. Then God called him a fool in verse 20. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who is the one who will own what you have prepared? Well, he's a fool. I thought it might be moron because that is the Greek word for fool. This one's a little bit different. It just means without sense. I mean, there's no sense in thinking that a large granary is the meaning to life. I mean, okay, if it's viewed as a blessing from God and viewed as something to be used from God, then not a thing wrong with abundance, not a thing wrong with a large granary. But to think that that is the reason to live or that is the reason that everything is taken care of, to think that is alone, well, that's not too sensible. And the word for fool means without sense. Well, again, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So man does not live by bread alone. Man does not live by a big granary. Now, in our farm, I think of corn cribs. Grandpa did grow wheat and oats, but more corn. Well, okay. Just got great big buildings full of corn. Well, good. Reason to live, not very good. Uh, reason to think that everything else is taken care of, not very good. Not a very good reason for life. Verse 20, I think, actually is plural. They are demanding your soul. It means he wasn't going to make it. I, it's kind of interpretation. Uh, human killers? Are human killers demanding your soul? Is that what will happen? They are demanding your soul. Supernatural beings taken away at the time of death. Uh, in the coming story of the rich man in Lazarus, Luke 16, 22, the poor man died and was carried away by angels. 
that the poor man was a believer to be carried away by angels. Uh, hear what? They're coming for you. Either criminals or demons. That'd be a good guess. Not very good. Uh, we do see life after death. That in both cases, uh, both these uh, stories, uh, a life after death, coming again with a rich man and Lazarus, both are alive. All are made in the image of God. Part of that is holiness. That image of God was lost at the fall. We are not like God in being holy, but all people are like God in the sense of being eternal. Believers or unbelievers, life after death. Believers or unbelievers, eternal. It seems that he had no heirs. Uh, Ecclesiastes does come to mind because Solomon says a very similar thing in Ecclesiastes 2, 18 and 19. Uh, Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor, for what I have labored for under the sun, I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor, for which I have labored. This too is vanity. Well, Solomon had heirs, and uh, his point was he might be all right, might not be, but his point was, I won't be in control anymore. Whether there were heirs or no heirs, that's a true point. I will not be in control anymore. Uh, God gives abundance, and instead of living for God, he was living just for the abundance and God calls him a fool, and in this case, there don't seem to be any heirs, and uh, he was not rich towards God. So uh, rich towards God, we might say uh, profitable in God's work, productive in God's work. I, uh, I don't think it'd be good to leave out literal profit as long as uh, God is in charge of one person's life, but... I think if we say uh, profitable for God, productive for God, we would have things that make actual money and things that don't make money but still are in the category of profitable for God, productive for God. Uh, often we can tell what a person's values are. Uh, we mainly only know self by, by, by what we spend our money on. That would be verse 21. So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Uh, not productive for God. Not profitable for God. Uh, God might give a bunch. There were rich people like Abraham had a lot. Solomon had a lot. Luke mentioned the ladies that... Uh, Joanna and Susanna in Luke chapter 8, verse 3, that kept Jesus going so he didn't have to work in his earthly ministry. And there will be uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus that did seem to have uh, a good amount. Uh, but beyond the uh, finances for God and actual profit for God, there's other forms of richness towards God. Uh, doing things that produce for God and his kingdom. I uh, plan on going ahead with verse 22 and following because uh, kind of what goes together is living for money and worry. They, they do go together, living, living for God and worry. So uh, let's read about, he kind of switches to worry now, but it does make sense that the two topics fit each other. Verse 22. And he said to his disciples, for this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body what you will put on. For the body is more than food, life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds, which of you by worrying can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? 
Jesus had uh, talked about birds previously in Luke chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. He said that uh, five sparrows were sold for two cents. And the point being there is people are a lot more valuable than birds. Uh, that comes in again in this second reference to birds. That's the point. Uh, we are a lot more valuable to God than birds are. And uh, if God cares for the birds, God cares for us even more. The next two verses are about uh, clothing. All of the pictures are about flowers. Verse 27 Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself not like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? Uh, mostly in the Bible, glory is God. You know, attention, brightness, splendor. Sometimes in the Bible, other things are glory, like stars, like flowers, like women's hair, 1 Corinthians 11, like a bride all dressed up for her wedding day. So there are things on earth that are in the category of glory that picture God's glory. And the point being here is if God uh, makes flowers look good, he'll give us enough so that uh, in our wardrobe we can look good enough. No need to worry about food. If God feeds the birds, he'll take care of us. No need to worry about how we look because if the flowers look good, then God will make sure we look good enough. Now we come to the conclusion, and I think actually verse 31 is the most important of the text here in the middle of this sermon. We'll begin reading at verse 29. And do not seek what you will eat, what you will drink. Do not keep worrying for all these things. The nations of the world, the ethnos of the world, eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. Verse 31. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added unto you. So it's kind of like, uh, take care of things today. It's okay if you call worry, quote, concern. It's okay, like in Psalm 127, where you get up and do a good day's work, but then at the end of the day, turn it over to God, and uh, not stay up all night worrying about it. Uh, in the parallel of the Sermon on the Mount, each day has enough trouble of its own. It's okay to get up and take care of things for that day, but then at the end of the day, give it over to God. That's uh, kind of why we picked Philippians 4 for our scripture reading. And do not want to read all of Philippians 4, but be anxious for nothing. Let your request be known unto God. That's kind of like... Uh, Worry about today's things, do the best you can, then at the end of the day, be anxious for nothing. Roll it over to God, like Psalm 127, get up and do a day's work, but at the end of the day, try to have peace of mind at night. And Philippians 4 continues that when the worries were given to God and the efforts were made for that day, then it has a list of thoughts and go from thoughts of concern and thoughts of trying, don't need to try anymore today, and uh, go over into uh, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. So it seems like Psalm 127, and then it seems like Philippians 4, and then it seems like Luke 12, parallel in Matthew 6, do what we can about today's things, work on that do list, but then at the end of the day, don't stay up all night on the do list. Just to turn that part over to God and not very much worry. Seek his kingdom and all these things will be added to you. Uh, next few verses, I mean, God will take care of the needs God might give abundance, but God will take care of the needs. 
He will take care of the very basics, and it's okay to try. Try and trust. It's okay to work on today's problems, but at the end, seek first his kingdom. These things will be added to you. Uh, might interpret a little bit on kingdom. Kingdom would be church. Kingdom would also be look forward to when he comes again. And he's king of kings and lords of lords, and he'll put away all of the wrong, and he'll make everything right, and then he'll rule a political kingdom on this earth. So seeking the kingdom would be seeking his work in the church as a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, but then seeking for the second coming. Okay, thank you for sitting over here all that time. When the musicians please come. <laughs>